Inverse functions should be a topic you covered in algebra, so this video will be a short review. We're just laying the foundation to learn the inverse trig functions in the next video, TR-23. Let's start with functions. You can think of a function as an imaginary box that performs some mathematical operation on an input value and produces a resulting output value. In very general terms, input x, output y. And the variable y is what the function evaluates to when x is its argument. Suppose our function divided x by 2 and then subtracted 1. An input value of 2 would result in an output value of 0. So when x is 2, f of x is 0. Input 8, output 3. f of 8 equals 3. X is the independent variable, and f of x is the dependent variable, because its value depends on the value for x. These pairs of numbers are ordered pairs, and functions can be graphed easily by plotting their independent and dependent variables as points on a Cartesian coordinate system. This is a linear function, so we only need two points to graph it. The yellow line is f of x equals x over 2 minus 1. A function must return exactly one value for each member of its domain. So if I took an input x value of 5, for example, and my imaginary box generated two different numbers for it, say 1 and 7, then the box would not represent a mathematical function. It would be a mathematical relation, which is fine, but it's not a function. Functions pass the vertical line test. A vertical line sweeping through the values in a function's domain will never intersect the function graph at more than one point. It may be clearer to show a counterexample. In this case, a vertical line intersects the graph at two points, so the graph is not the graph of a function. A function will always give you one y value for a particular x value. Now let's think of another function represented by this pink box. Let's take the output of the first function and pipe it into the input of the second function. Suppose the second function returns the same value that we put into the first function. In general, x goes into function f and y comes out, then y into function g and x comes out. In this case, each function is the inverse function of the other. An inverse function reverses the input and output of another function. You can also consider that an inverse function undoes the operation of the other function. The ordered pairs of inverse functions are reversed from each other, so the two sample points we chose for the first function are reversed for its inverse. So corresponding to yellow point 2 comma 0, we instead have pink point 0 comma 2, and instead of 8 comma 3, we have 3 comma 8. This is true for every point in the function's domain, and the range of each function is its inverse's domain. The mathematical procedure to generate a function's inverse is straightforward. Write the function's equation with y and x. So for our example, the function f of x is y equals x over 2 minus 1. Rewrite the equation, but switch x and y. Then solve for y using algebra. The new expression with x is the inverse of the original function. The notation of inverse functions is a superscripted negative 1 between the function label and the argument. It looks like an exponent, or to my British or Indian audience, an index, but it doesn't mean reciprocal. The symbology is a little unfortunate because it can be confusing. The reciprocal of a function would have its exponent after the argument. If a function returns y with an argument of x, then its inverse function returns x with an argument of y. Because coordinates are reversed, functions and their inverses are symmetrical about the line y equals x. In the next video, TR-23, we'll investigate the inverses of the trig functions.